everybody. Welcome to me, Craig. I am Eric, I'm one of the brewers here. Uh, and this is the third uh, of our Jackson Crawford series, which will be going on every month uh, for the remainder of the year. When is the next one again? What April 24th. April 24th Southwest. is the next one, so keep an eye out for that. Um, if you guys could, uh, silence your cell phones, uh, and then uh, we'll have a brief intermission about halfway through, uh, so everybody can get up, get a drink, and all that good stuff. Um, try to uh, hold your questions for the end, if you could. Um, other than that, yeah, have a good time. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Eric, Susan, sort of. Let's go on. Sort of people of Main Creek. Uh, my name is Jackson Crawford. Possibly, if you're here, you're familiar with my uh, YouTube channel. And uh, if you're familiar with the YouTube channel, you might have taken a look now and then at the comments, the things that people say below videos. And you might note that there are three main things people complain about. I'm not a pagan, therefore it's illegitimate for me to talk about this which I've never really understood. <laughs> One of my best friends is a paleontologist, and he's still qualified to talk about dinosaurs. Maybe not a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a dinosaur. Uh, number two is, uh, well, I'll just throw in, like, the sort of assorted, uh, you film in front of a blue screen, therefore this sucks. Um, <laughs> I do not film in front of a blue screen or a green screen. I live in Colorado. Yeah. As you know, <laughs> it is not hard to find pretty places to film in front of. <laughs> and number three is I talk too quiet. Um, so this may be a problem for you right now. I don't know. I mean, we could always try adjusting this volume. Uh, I'm a naturally quiet speaker. Uh, I do use microphones, believe it or not. But I bow to the pressure of my audience <laughs> so, I'm going to make you regret this complaint. <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you. You got props. Yeah. <laughs> I considered turning it on, but then I decided that it would probably actually hurt. <laughs> Uh, I've also recently been sick, so I'm sure I'm even quieter, so sorry, I don't know. Like, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Sound good. Sound good. Someone's already complaining in their heart. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't hear me, but I can hear you. <laughs> um, I came to work. So, this is the third of my monthly talks at Meet Creeper Meadery. Uh, I've had a really good time doing these. Uh, we started off in September with a talk about mead and Norse myth and decided to start doing this uh, monthly thing in 2024. And so what I'm trying to do is kind of create a continuous series of talks where like, there's kind of a benefit, kind of an incentive to come to all of them sequentially, but you don't have to. So I'm not gonna assume that you were here in January or February. I see some familiar faces in the familiar faces. Also, some faces I don't think I've seen before. Uh, but what I want to talk about tonight, after talking about let's see, creation in January, and then we got Uthen in February, is a really central part of the Norse mythos that I think is undervalued and underplayed in many surveys of it, which is the mythical heroes. Right? So if you ever pick up the Poetic Edda, that compilation of 30 or so poems written down in medieval Iceland, you'll find that uh, they pick up a used copy in a bookstore. And the part of it that actually has thumb marks in the middle of the page will be all the first half, right? In fact, it might be just the first two poems because people tend to kind of stop as they get about halfway through and they're not reading about, you know, Odin and Thor anymore, but reading about the mythical heroes known as the Volsungs. But I think that's a shame because the Volsungs inhabit the same cosmos and in fact, the gods interact with them very directly, and their story is a lot of fun. I actually don't really know 
why there has not been some kind of Marvel-ish adaptation of this story yet, because it would make a pretty killer trilogy. In fact, that's probably what I would do, is if I didn't enjoy the trilogy. Yeah, it all listen to me. Um, <laughs> I mean, I could talk about the ones that do listen to me, for better or for worse, but Marvel isn't one of them. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is give you a little run through of the saga of Wolves. It's not the whole thing. This is going to be probably a two-parter. <coughs> but the story is just wild. And uh, if you've heard me talk about it before, I don't know, sorry, but this is, this is your live opportunity. <laughs> Um, there are a ton of names, so I have a whiteboard. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Yep. Uh, which, I don't know, this really harkens back for me to the earliest days of the YouTube channel, where I was sitting in my office at Berkeley, just writing on a whiteboard, and I didn't know how to edit videos yet and all, so this is kind of fun. Uh, there are a ton of names. If you want all of the names, Meat Krieger sells my books, and they have the Saga of the Volsungs in the back, which has a whole family tree. Um, so if you want to check that out, uh, do so, of course. In fact, bring me a Saga of the Volsungs to sign tonight, and I will sign it in a way that you will never see it signed any other day. How long did you get a draw? Or do a draw? Oh, give some away. Oh, my goodness. I got some away at the end, though, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the Volsung family, there are a ton of names, and most of them begin, how far back can you read this? This is going to be like an eye test. Okay. Um, I should have said, sorry, this is Hall. You need to get your eyes checked. It's a really good place on Eisenhower over here. So Sig means victory, and uh, most of their names contain this word. <laughs> um, so do many of the members, so do many of the people who come up in the story who are not members of this family. So that makes this complicated, sort of. To them, it is a feature. Because remember, Old Norse poetry is a literary, right? Ten terrible tyrannosauruses on the tower on Tuesday, right? <laughs> they like family members to have alliterating names because, of course, they want to mention them in the same stanza of a poem, right? So kind of contrary to our inclination where we want our fictional characters to have maximally distinct names, right? If I'm watching a TV show and there's two characters named Steve, I'm already giving up. Right? <laughs> uh, but contrary to us, they actually want related people to have similar looking names. So the Saga of the Bull Sings, together with its medieval fanfic sequel, which we'll cover a little bit at the end. The medieval fanfic sequel is the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. Ragnar Lothbrok was not originally connected to the Volsung mythos, but uh, he was sort of written into it by fanfic writers in the 1200s. There is medieval fanfic that's absolutely a thing. These two sagas together, they are written as one unit, uh, covers seven generations, but the first couple aren't uh, dealt with in much detail. The very first member of the family we read about is Siggy, and Siggy is a son of Odin. So much like the Greek gods, the Norse gods travel around among human beings and occasionally uh, have dalliances with mortal women. So Siggy is the result of one of Odin's dalliances with some mortal woman. A Siggy is the king of Hunland, which I think is kind of fun. The Norse have a vague, distant cultural memory of this group of people called the Huns. And they have no memory whatsoever of the fact that they came from Asia. They just kind of remember them as this vaguely badass group of guys who really did a lot of damage to the Roman Empire. And because of their alliances with the Goths, they kind of get mixed up with the Goths in the Norse memory and sort of blended into kind of like a proto-Norse people. They weren't, but they kind of feel treated that way. So Sig is a king of Hunland, and he goes hunting with another man's slave and the slave kills way more animals than he does, and the animals he kills are better than the animals Siggy kills. Siggy cannot stand this, so he kills the slave. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah. Because of this, he is banished. Okay, wait, hold on, I forgot, he's not king yet. <laughs> he's a noble one, he's just a noble guy when this starts. He's banished from the kingdom, leaves, Odin gives him an army, he comes back, he conquers it, then he becomes king. 
Sorry, mm, that's how it works. And he has a uh, son named Rere. Now, if you note that uh, the mead of poetry is Oath Rerir. Oath is madness, like the name Odin, the mad god. And Rerir is mover. So Rerir is really like mover, stirrer. So Rerir inherits the kingdom from his father and uh, marries, but he and his wife fail to conceive an heir. So they pray to the gods, and Odin and Freya or is it Odin and Freya is telling? I can't remember, they get so mixed up. Hear their prayer, and Odin decides, you know what? I'm gonna send them a child, and the way he does this is he sends a Valkyrie disguised as a crow to Rear uh, with an apple. And uh, while Rear is sitting on top of a burial mound, a place where kings were often seen, pictured in the sagas, contemplating their fate, uh, this crow flies up, drops this apple in his lap, and he seems to understand what the apple's for, so he eats a little bit of it, goes to see his wife, and they conceive a child. Unfortunately, Rerir now runs off and gets killed in battle, leaving his wife pregnant. And his wife is pregnant for the next six years. <laughs> Which is... <laughs> Well, it's just the most horrifying part of any of those <laughs> So after six years, his wife, who by the way, is never named. I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, well, she, she's never named. She decides, you know what, I am sick of being pregnant. Cut this child out of me. And so she has one of, the, uh, one of her guardsmen or something take a sword and cut this child out of her. And so this sort of six-year-old busts out of it, <laughs> you know, with the, with, the, with the sword cutting him out, you know, the guitar so was screaming in the background. <laughs> and as his mother dies, he kisses her, and he says, Mother, I swear that I will never flee from fire nor from iron so long as I live. And the guitar just screamed. <laughs> and so this is Wilson. All right, so the Norse don't have family names, right? Uh, this is a pretty well-known fact, but uh, the Norse and modern Iceland groups don't have inherited last names, right? So uh, my dad's name is Craig. If by the Icelandic rule of Norse system, my last name would be Craig's son, literally. And then if I have a son, his name is Jackson's son, right? If I have a daughter, she's Jackson's daughter. So they don't have inherited family names. But if you had a really awesome awesome ancestor, you might be referred to collectively as the that guys. <laughs> so the descendants of Volsung are collectively called Volsungs. Now that may actually be that originally uh, Volsung is the name of people descended from him and that his name, maybe I shouldn't be telling you this, but I don't see anyone here who's obviously uh, underage for hearing about this particular idea. His name potentially is Volsi originally, and then Volsung would make a lot of sense because uh, I would just be a descendant of, of Volsi. Uh, does anybody know what Volsi means? <laughs> 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 huh? Lady parts. No. <laughs> no one? No. It means horses dig. Oh. <laughs> it means <laughs> but this is actually an incredibly lucky name right they think of names in terms of luck and what does a stallion symbolize if not the ultimate in virility right a stallion is a fighter he has his many successes with the ladies. Um, right, I mean, like it's, it's, in terms of symbolism, it's not a bad Norse name, actually. But uh, for the purposes of our story, at least the saga, of course, his name is just Volsung, and his descendants will be known as the Volsungs. Now, Volsung has 10 children with his wife. By the way, his wife, the Valkyrie that Odin sent to bring the apple to his death. 
for whatever reason. He marries her after she's a crow. She's not a crow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so Bolson and the Valkyrie named Kyo have ten, ten children. So, uh, hopefully you can see all this. So I have a son named Sigmund, a daughter named Signe, and then eight Richards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for indulging. <laughs> You know, this was going to be a night when I pulled up. <laughs> um, but, well, they, we never get their names. And when we don't get names, we know what they're there for. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so Sigma and Signe are twins. Um, <coughs> as they grow up, Signe, the daughter, is approached by the king of a neighboring land who Yes, has another name, starts with Sig. His name is Siggair. And he comes to Volsung and he says, I would like to marry your daughter, Signe. And Volsung says, this seems like a pretty good batch. I mean, you're, you know, you're a king, cool, you win battles. And Signe says, please don't marry me to this man. And uh, she says, actually, I, I think one of the most truly heartbreaking lines uh, that you can find in Norse literature, she says, nothing in my heart smiles for him. Mm -hmm. right, it's pretty grim. Yeah. But he says, ah, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> this is always, by the way, a bad sign. Anytime you read the sagas and a, uh, a woman tells her dad, I don't want to marry this guy, it is always going to be bad. The woman is never wrong about it. <laughs> Basically, this is always just the dad setting himself up for failure. <laughs> um, they have interesting marriage and divorce mores. They do have divorce, but it's like your first marriage, your parents should probably decide who it is. But the kid should probably get a veto. So she doesn't get a veto. So Sigair comes for the wedding feast, which is held at Volsung's place. And uh, Volsung has a grand hall with a tree in the middle of it. And depending on which paragraph of the saga you read, this tree is either called an apple tree or an oak tree. And its name, is Bardstock. If you speak a Scandinavian language, you may see what that means, literally. Barn, child, tree. child is barn, stock. Stick. Stick, tree, yeah. <laughs> Family tree, metaphorically. So he's got this big tree in the middle of the song. During the wedding feast, his daughter Signe is getting reluctantly married to King Sigir. A man comes into the hall. No one has ever seen this man. <laughs> He's dressed in gray with a wide-brimmed hat. <laughs> Excellent fashion choice. He has one eye. He leans on a staff. You can see where this is going, potentially. And this man, who no one has ever seen, walks up to Barnstock the tree and stabs a sword into it. I, I love the symbolism of this, by the way. The, tree, the sword into the family tree. I mean, like it's it's so perfect. Mm -hmm. And he says, "Whoever withdraws this sword from the tree will receive the sword as a gift from me." So, if you know anything about Odin, and we covered quite a bit of him last month in this talk, <laughs> this is this is a gift with strings attached. Mm -hmm. So everybody tries to pull it out, King Arthur style, right? But the only one who can pull it out is Sigmund, right? The son of Wilson. Now, Sigir, the bridegroom, approaches Sigmund and says, Hey, man, it's my wedding. That sword would make a fantastic wedding gift. And Sigmund says, Give me a break. If that sword is meant for you, you would have pulled it out. I'm keeping it. Sigir is so mad when he hears this that he just ups and leaves. He says, All right, I'm taking my wife and I'm going. Now, this scandalizes everybody because you're supposed to hang out and get drunk for three days after you get married. In fact, in some areas, it is illegal not to. <laughs> <laughs> Medieval law is great. Um, but he says, okay, yeah, yeah, I've got something else came up, whatever. But, um, you know, I've got to beat the weather. Um, but, Wilson, I invite you and your sons, just your sons, don't bring like an army or anything, you and your sons. 
to come to my kingdom in a few months and I'll throw like a makeup wedding feast. And Folsom says, cool. I see nothing suspicious about this. <laughs> so a few months later, Folsom and his sons get into a ship and they sail the Sigurd's kingdom and they arrive in the evening. Now, hospitality is a central tenet of Norse culture. There's no hotels, right? So it is expected that when you're traveling around, there's a, a code of reciprocity that says, I'm gonna knock on your door, you're gonna knock on mine, everybody has to stay with everybody else at some point. In fact, this can even overcome pretty deep feuds between families, hospitality is just so strong. But it's not considered polite to knock after the sun is set. So the sun is setting, they don't wanna show up at an unlucky time, they're just gonna stay in their ship overnight. But Signy, daughter, comes out to the ship and says, Dad, this is such a bad idea. You haven't been invited to a feast, you've been invited to an ambush. As soon as you and my brothers get off of the ship tomorrow, you're gonna be killed in this ambush. And Volsung says, I mean, what any of us would say to our daughter in this situation, that is your husband's secret plan. You do not betray your husband's oh. secret plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna pretend like I didn't even hear this. <laughs> you go home to your husband, and no one, here's the real heart of the matter, no one will ever mock my sons for being afraid. Right. Like, it's like who, and in fact, the postscript to this, and he says this, what woman would bury my sons if they heard that we didn't walk into that air bush? A live one? Well, <laughs> 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 if, that, if that's her retort, it would be a good one. <laughs> well, she goes home, Volsung and his sons dutifully wake up the next morning and are ambushed. Volsung himself is killed and the nine sons are captured. So Sigair, the evil king, stroking his goatee probably, he says, well, I'm just gonna behead these guys. And Sigurd says, no, wait, kill them slowly. <laughs> <laughs> he says, why should I kill your brother slowly? I really just wanted to decapitate them. She says, no, 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 no. The eye loves what it lingers on. And I wanna look at my brothers for longer, so kill them slow. And he says, well, that's crazy, but I've got a plan. My mom, who's a wolf, <laughs> Genealogy in the socks is coming. Um, hey, remember Loki and Angerboda have three kids a snake, a wolf, and a half corpse. So, genealogy is muddy. <laughs> so, it's a recessive gene. <laughs> she says, Well, my mom is a wolf. Uh, she'll handle this. What we'll do is we'll tie them up at stocks, right? And every night at midnight, my mom will come and eat one of them. <laughs> so, for the next eight nights, Sydney has to watch as her eight brothers are eaten by the wolf. Oh no, nameless brother number one. Oh no, nameless brother number two. All of their red shirts turn even darker red <laughs> like their blood as they're consumed by the wolf. And soon she realizes she's only gonna have her brother with a name left. And he's clearly the one she needs to save because of his name. He's clearly the protagonist. <laughs> so she comes up with a plan. She uh, hands a big pot of honey to a slave of hers and says, go out to my brother. The slave seems to understand what this is for. Goes out to where Sigmund is sitting in the stocks and covers him in honey and then fills his mouth with honey. Sigmund also seems to understand what is going on. <laughs> So when the wolf comes at midnight, uh, she's ready to eat him, but then, oh, it's, it's honey. Wow, that smells like the excellent quality of honey sold here, this local Colorado honey is super here. And so she licks it all up, and she's ready to bite him, but then he opens his mouth, and she realizes there's more honey in there. So she Frenches him, <laughs> he bites down on her tongue, and she struggles so hard against him that she breaks him out of the stocks and then he wrestles the wolf to death. And the guitar screams again. <laughs> so now he's free. But he's alone, he's in an enemy kingdom. What is he gonna do? He goes out to the woods and makes himself a turf house. I should probably pause this area following this. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this 
this help? Yes. <laughs> No, I just, like, I just, uh, it's been, what, like 25 minutes, just want to make sure. <laughs> All right, I think it's a fun story. So, what's plan B? Sigma and Signe meet up now and then to talk about the fact that we've got to avenge our dad, got to avenge our brothers. But Sigma can't do it alone, right? How, what, who, what is one man against an entire army of his enemies, right? We need at least, like, Two men <laughs> against an entire army of our enemies. So Signe says, well, yeah, I've got to have a son. Right. So she has two sons with her husband, Sigir, neither of whom is named. <laughs> this is, again, a bad sign. And as they reach about 10 years old, she tests them. And uh, her test is she sews their clothing to their skin and then rips the clothing away. And you'll be disappointed to hear that the boys cry when she does this. <laughs> yeah, this is not a good sign. Nonetheless, even though that's, you know, they seem like pretty unpromising little brats, as they turn about 10, well, she sends the, the oldest one out to Sigma in the forest and says, go train up with, you know, your uncle Sigma. And, uh, you know, the kid shows up at Sigma's turf house and says, hey, Mom sent me here to train with you. So he says, yeah, cool. Well, um, I guess my Mr. Miyagi thing is I need you to make bread. And uh, here's a bag of flour. I'm going to go gather firewood while you make bread. So he goes and gathers firewood, comes back, and the kid hasn't made any bread. He says, hey, what, what's up? I told you to make bread with this bag of flour. And the kid says, well, yeah, but there's a poisonous snake in there. So he says, gosh, man, this all about this kid. So the next time that he meets up with Signe, Signe says, hey, how's it going training up my, my kid? And Sigma delivers this fantastic Norse burn. Says, no matter how close he is, I don't feel like there's a man near. <laughs> it's cold. So she says, kill him. <laughs> so he does. And the next one, turns about 10, she does the clothes test, he cries. She sends him to Sigma, he does the bag of flower test, he cries, and so Sigma has to kill him too. So what is Sigma gonna do? You know, she's got the best genes in the world, Bolson genes, you know what I mean? Like, who could be better than Bolson? But apparently, Sig here just isn't cool enough to father like a Bolson quality kid. <laughs> Where can she find a dad? No. <laughs> a dad of like full soon level quality. It's almost like <laughs> she needs another full soon. So conveniently, a uh, witch is traveling through the kingdom shortly thereafter, and um, Sydney meets up with this witch. She says, "Hey, can, do you have like..." polymorph potion or whatever. Can you, can you change faces with me? And the witch says, oh, sure, sure. So the witch takes Signe's face, and he takes the witch's face. The witch sleeps with Signe, like she's Signe, and Signe goes wandering in the woods, acting like she's lost. And she comes to, Sig to Sigmund's, uh, Sigmund's turf house. And uh, she says, oh, me, oh, my, I'm lost. And uh, Sigmund, you know, comes out the door and says, hospitality is essential tenant of our culture. He <laughs> 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 says, uh, you know, you're welcome to sleep with me, and I mean sleep with me. <laughs> and so they sleep together for three nights, and then she goes back, changes faces with the witch again, and nine months later gives birth to a horrible inbred mutant, actually one of the greatest heroes of Norse culture. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's double the Molson. <laughs> and his name is Sinfjali. Not a beautiful name, perhaps. Yes. So he's double of Wilson. Mm. So Sinfjali, actually, he doesn't know his dad is Sigmund, by the way. He thinks his dad is Sigurd. Um, but he turns about 10, and uh, his mom does the same test she did to the older kids, sews his clothes to his skin and rips it out. Sinfjali doesn't cry. And she says, hey, didn't that hurt a little bit? And he says, 
I don't think it's anything that my grandfather Wilson would have thought of as much pain. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. <laughs> so she sends him to Sigma to train up. Once again, Sigma does this Mr. Biagi thing, says, okay, I'm gonna go get firewood, you make some bread. Sigma goes out, gets firewood, comes back, and there's a fresh loaf of bread on the table. It's like, all right, hey, well, kid, didn't you find something else in that bag of flour? And Cephalia says, yeah, there was a uh, poisonous snake in there, but I just kneaded it in with the dough. <laughs> so like, all right. <laughs> this is our, this, this is the kid I need. So, for the next several years, he trains them up. And this is Viking culture, right? So how does he train them? They just rob and kill people in the woods. Right? I mean, they're not their family members, so there's no real moral quandary about it. It's just whatever, you know, he's training up, it's fighting. And uh, this particular incident, uh, they rob these guys, two wealthy travelers who have wolf skins with them. And for whatever reason, Sigma and Sinfield put the wolf skins on and they turn into wolves. <laughs> now the saga has anticipated your question, can they talk to each other still? Well, not in human language, but they understand each other's barks and howls. <laughs> so, thankfully, this is addressed. And so they talk, and so Sigma says, you know, this is a real setback for the robbing part of our plan, because now we don't need like the valuables that we did see. <laughs> but it's not a setback for the killing part. Let's keep going, travelers. Let's keep stick with that part of the plan. But let's split up. Now, if one of us runs into seven or more travelers at once, howl for help, and the other one will come and help. But under seven, you know, handle it on your own. So they split up, and after a little while, Sigmund comes across seven travelers, howls for help, Sinfiotli comes, helps them to kill them, they part again. Then Sinfiotli comes across 11 travelers, doesn't howl for help, kills them all, then howls, and Sigmund comes and says, what, what's up? You know, like we agreed that we would howl for help if there were more than seven. Sinfiotli says, yeah, I guess I'm freer than you are. So they fight. <laughs> Sigmund ends up biting Sinfiotli in the throat. So Sinfiotli is dying in front of him. Sigmund thinks, well, this is bad. And uh, by coincidence or design, a raven drops a leaf next to him. Uh, he watches as a weasel is fighting another weasel, picks up the leaf, puts the leaf on the other weasel, and it kills him. I mean, this, <laughs> this is the most plot convenience cutscene that I've ever viewed. It's like, okay, the leaf is healing power. So he puts the leaf on his son nephew's throat, and it heals. And after nine days of being wolves, apparently this was only nine days, everything's nines, uh, they turn back into people and then they burn the wolf skins. But Sigmund decides, well, that's, that's enough. You've been training with me for years. Now you've even done the wolf thing. It is time for us to avenge my dad and brothers. So they put on their armor, gather up their weapons, and they go to Sigir's Fort Hall, and they wait outside, waiting for their opportunity to ambush them. Now, in the time since Sinfield was born, Sigir and Signy have had two more little children who were never given names. <laughs> right. see this is going. And they're on the floor of the hall playing like marbles with rings. They're like shooting rings around on the floor. I don't know. It's kind of a high rent full of marbles, I guess. And one of these little kids, they seem like they're probably single digit age, uh, you know, ends up skipping one of these rings outside the door. And presumably the film goes into slow motion as he turns to his brother and says, I'll be right back. <laughs> I love you, brother. I love you, brother. I love mommy. <laughs> mommy certainly loves us. <laughs> anyway. I actually knew some kids who talked like that. It was really weird. Um, so this kid runs outside, grabs his ring, and he sees these two scary men in armor that he's never seen before. So he runs back into the hall and he's like, Mommy, Daddy, there's two scary men in armor outside. So Signy picks up the kid, marches out, picks up the other kid on their way out, comes to where Signy and Signy are waiting in ambush, throws her two little sons at their feet and says, <laughs> your nephews have betrayed you, kill them. <laughs> 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 it's 
Cichlid's like, I'm not gonna kill your little kids. Cichlid says, I'll kill your little kids. <laughs> so he kills them. They march into the hall. Sinfield throws the corpses of the two children. Sigurd speaks says, hey, what's up? We're the Volsungs, we're here to revenge. Volsung and his, his other sons, besides my uncle here. It's totally just my uncle. <laughs> so naturally, they're just two men. So even though they're awesome heroes, by your standards, I mean, they are child killers. It's sort of hard to work into our morality, maybe. But uh, they are captured. And uh, Sigurd decides, well, now I'm really going to kill them slowly. Twisted. So he says, I'm going to bury them alive. So he has a huge pit dug, and uh, before burying them, he puts a huge like slab of rock between them so that they're separated from each other in their big pit in the ground where they're going to die. And um, as the pit is being filled in, Sinfiotli throws a big rack of ribs. <laughs> Six sitting through his big rack of ribs of Sinfield. And Sinfield says, Well, hey, at least I'm not going to go hungry. But as he's eating the ribs, he realizes that the sword of Sigmund is hidden inside the ribs. So the sword is a gift from Odin, right? It's made of adamantium or whatever. <laughs> so he sticks a cap up to him. <laughs> oh my god. I forgot that the Avatar metal was even super <laughs> Isn't that like the highest gross movie of all time? <laughs> this could be. Yeah, this could be. Probably have to tamp down the child kid. <laughs> but Sinfeli sticks the sword through the rock, and they can cut it, of course, and then Simon grabs it on the other end, and they saw through the rock, and they get out of the pit. And it's nighttime, so they barricade um, Sigurd's Hall, and they burn it down. And as the uh, Hall is burning and everyone is dying inside. Uh, Sigmund calls out to his sister Signy. He says, Signy, we don't want you to die. Come on out. Signy steps out of the flames for a moment. And she says, uh, well, and this always reminds me of my mom at Thanksgiving. <laughs> I was married to my husband unwillingly, but I will die with him willingly. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that I have done has been to bring about his downfall. <laughs> so I'm going to die inside. Oh, by the way, he, uh, Sigmund, Sigmund is also totally your son. I slept with you. I was the witch. <laughs> she, she does tell him this. Basically, just that much of a footnote. She goes back inside and dies. <laughs> so Sigmund and his son, nephew, Sigir, sail. Back to Hanlan, take it over from the pretender who had claimed the throne. And Volsung becomes, excuse me, Sigmund becomes a great king. Uh, he marries uh, with his first wife. He has a son named Hilke, who's actually one of the heroes of uh, three really interesting poems in the poetic edda. Totally glossed over in the Song of Volsung, so I'll kind of gloss over here and say there's another song in school too. See the poetic edda for more. <laughs> or I'll do something on Hilke. It's, it breaks the flow of the main goals of the um, But Sinfjöldi and uh, Sigmund's first wife, uh, Sigmund's first wife's brother, have a fight over a woman that they both want to marry. And Sinfjöldi kills Sigmund's wife's brother. Does that make sense? His uncle in law, I guess. So uh, Sigmund's wife asks him to banish. Sinfiotli from the kingdom, and Sigmund says, I'm not going to banish my son, even if he did kill your brother. Um, but I'll throw a great funeral for your brother. And uh, so <laughs> his, his wife, uh, poor kill, is like, yeah, okay, fine. So he throws a big funeral feast. And at the funeral feast, uh, poor kill, new wife, our first, first wife, Sigmund, comes around to Sinfiotli with a uh, special batch of mead. Not as special as the meat and meat for your meter. <laughs> and actually way more poison. <laughs> and she says, hey, uh, Cynthia, like, drink this special meat that I brought for you. And he looks at it and he thinks it looks kind of weird, so he hands it to his dad, and Sigmund drinks it. Sigmund, by the way, is impervious to poison. Mm -hmm. Most of the heroes of the sagas have some minor superpower like this. 
So his Meyer superpowers is impervious to poison. Uh, so she comes around a second time, she's like, hey, it looks like you missed that uh, special need that I brought you here. Here's another survey. And he's like, nah, dad, you take it. A third time she comes around, always threes in fairy tales and that's right. And she says, I didn't know you were such a coward that you could use to have a drink offered to you. Well, you challenge your bank's courage, it's pretty dicey. So Julie looks at Sigmund and Sigmund says, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Better wet that mustache, son. <laughs> so he drinks it and dies. <laughs> he challenged somebody's courage, it's a big deal. So Sigmund has this big no moment. How do you say that in old words? Nay. Oh, I should have done the uh, the laugh sound, ho, 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 <laughs> or the horse sound, neg, <laughs> neg, H-N-E-G-G. -G. Uh, so he grabs Sinfiotli's body and he goes wandering, you know, he's despondent, just wandering in the wilderness and he comes to a fjord, and at the fjord, he wants to cross it and there is a ferryman, a ferryman is a man he's never seen before. It's an old man just a gray, the white hat and one eye. And the fairy man says, I can take you both across, but not at the same time. This is more than one meaning, of course. Uh, so he says, put the body of your son on first, and Sigmund puts in his body on the boat, and the old man pushes off and disappears. And Sigmund comes back and uh, divorces his wife. <laughs> that really is what happened. Um, Interestingly, Sinfjallir, a little side note here, only person who canonically in Norse myth goes to Valhalla without dying in battle. And he's canonically in Valhalla, Valhalla because he actually appears in several poems as one of the straight men Odin is talking to, right? He's one of the guys who will ask Odin something like, well, why did you kill this kid if you liked him so much? And Odin will say, well, of course, because I need him for Ragnarok. But so, but he is, a, he is canonically in Valhalla in spite of not dying in battle. My guess is because he is double Volsun mm -hmm. and therefore doubly descended from Odin. Right. I think that's probably the magic. Uh, so, actually, I know, I know a good sign point is right after this. Sigmund divorces his wife and decides he wants to remarry. So he courts a woman named Hjordis. And another man uh, wanted to marry her, but she ends up choosing Sigmund between the two of them. And so the uh, man who wanted to marry him, marry her, uh, Lingby, leads an army to Sigmund's kingdom. And Sigmund rides out to fight with Lingby. And uh, he sees coming toward him in the enemy army. An old man he's never seen before. Mm -hmm. He's dressed in gray. His wide brim hat is one eye, and all this goes. And he has a spear. He's riding a horse, and he's coming at Sigmund hard. And he thrusts the spear at Sigmund. Sigmund takes the sword that was given to him by Odin, swings it at the spear, and the sword shatters. Nice. Right. Odin has class. So Sigmund is killed in battle. But since he's protagonist, he doesn't get last words. His wife is uh, searching the bodies on the battlefield after the battle. She finds her husband. She says, oh my god, you're dead. He says, no, I'm not. I'm the protagonist. I haven't had my last words yet. <laughs> so she says, what are, what are those last words? And he says, you're pregnant. <laughs> this actually happens pretty often with the song. <laughs> it's the guy who tells the woman. <laughs> you're pregnant. Uh, and it's a boy. And he is going to be the greatest hero ever. Name him Sigurd. And give him the sword that was broken. And so Sigmund dies, and Hjordis will remarry, but she will give birth before she remarries to the greatest hero of all time, Sigurd. So let's take a few minutes break, an intermission if you will, have some meat, have some snacks. Uh, 
and I'll come back in a few minutes and uh, talk a little bit more about signal. Remarks before I proceed to talk about Sigur, the greatest. I have a question. Sure. Why, why was it Signy and not Sigma? Because why is it very often at the end of the course? Well, it's, it's, it's in, so like if you're thinking about, you know, like in romance languages, an A is often a marker of a feminine name. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always the case in Old Norse. And in fact, uh, very often, Norse names are modified in English to add those A's. So like in Marvel, you'll see like Hella, Frigga, uh -huh. but in Old Norse, it's just Hell, Frigg. Yeah. Um, so. But I've never seen a Y. Yeah, it's, it's Signy, Dagny. Yeah, there's plenty, plenty of ladies' names that end in Y. Okay. Mm. Not E, like Signa, Signa, or like. No, I mean Signa, S-I-G-N-E, would be like a modern Norwegian or Swedish name. I think that's why. Yeah, yeah, but not an old Norse name. Okay. It should be the one. Yeah. So, Doris remarries, she moves to Denmark, and gives birth to Sigurd. And Sigurd is a medieval Mary Sue. He is taller than you, he is handsomer than you, he is more popular than you. He speaks more languages than you. <laughs> like all, he's a better swimmer than you. <laughs> he can jump higher than you. These are all explicitly stated. Um, and as is common among uh, well-placed Norse families, he is not brought up at home. They have a custom of sending their children away to be fostered by appropriate fosterers. And part of the notion here seems to be that um, a foster father will be sort of harder on your kid than you'll be, and you want him to kind of come up with that toughness. You know, you don't want a dad, like a dad figure out he's going to be too easy on him. But it's also a way of cementing alliances, right? I foster your kid, you foster mine, ties our families closer together. So Singer is fostered by a dwarf named Regan. So Regan brings him up, teaches him all the things he needs to know, and Singer is getting to be probably late teens or so, Reagan says, you know, I really hate seeing you. The way you run around here, like you're just some barefoot son of a peasant. So he's like, hey, what, what, what's up with this? Where, where are you going with this? Well, I just think you should do something worthy of your Bolson family name. He's like, I'm, I'm 17. <laughs> like, point me in the right direction. He says, I just feel like you should slay a dragon or something. You know? I feel like that would be appropriate to the grandeur of the whole series. He says, point me to a dragon. He says, well, I do know where there's a dragon you can slay. And so he says, well, tell me about it. Because I really want to hear about it. I want to kill this dragon. And Brian says, OK, I'll tell you, because he's my brother. And then <laughs> we disappear into Reagan's thought of it for a little bit. So Reagan says, I was one of three brothers. I was the son of Freyd Mark. I had a brother named Falknir, and I had a brother named Otter. Otter was an otter. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the Old Norse word otter is otter. O T R. So this doesn't get any better if I just use the Old Norse word because it's otter. <laughs> so this is my brother Otter. <laughs> It was an otter. By the way, so, so okay, I said, I said Reagan's a dwarf, right? His brother's an otter. <laughs> dwarf is a much vaguer term in Old Norse than it is to our kind of Tolkien-inspired culture, right? Tolkien kind of makes dwarves a more consistent thing than they are in Norse myth, right? They're not consistently gimly. They're not all short guys with big beards and axes. Um, it actually even seems like some dwarves just are animals. Like, otter never seems to be anything but an otter. Right, so it seems almost like you have sort of like humanoid things that are dwarves, but also animals that are dwarves, because there's another one who's a fish later. It's dwarves are much weirder than Tolkien dwarves. General, vague, supernatural being is not even. It's almost what I would say. So uh, he says, my brother Otter, he was an otter, and like otters do, he would sit on the riverbank and he would eat the food that he had caught. 
with his eyes closed. <laughs> we watch Otters and Divas. I'll watch some Otters and Gorka every once in a while. Um, and he says, so one day, my brother Otter was sitting eating a salmon with his eyes closed when who should walk by but the gods, Odin and Loki. Just hanging out. And Loki said, Odin, check this out. I'm going to get an otter and a salmon with one rock. He picks up a rock, <laughs> throws it at an otter, and kills otter. <laughs> so they pick up the otter and the fish, and they keep wandering. And towards the evening, they come to a house, and they knock on the door. And it's Freyvar's house. And they say, hey, uh, can we stay the night? Freyvar says, hospitality is essential to of our culture. Like, great, well, we didn't come empty handed, we brought food. Oh, salmon? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and an otter. <laughs> so, so, you know, Norse culture is not completely bloodthirsty. Um, you do have a moral obligation to get reparation for family members who were killed, but it doesn't have to be by a murder. You can agree on the monetary value of the person who's been killed and be paid that monetary value by the family that killed your family. It's like insurance. It's like insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, if I killed Eric's brother, all right, let's say, whoa. Well, it's just, I don't know. Like, maybe the one you just smelled out <laughs> Um. All right, hold on, I just forgot who killed you. I killed your brother. You come to me and you're like, man, I'm gonna kill you. It's like, hey, I'm sorry. He rode my horse and I swore I'd kill any man who rode my horse and you know, I can't break my oath. It's a real thing that happens in this life. Uh, I feel bad. What can I pay you that'll put, this, put us behind us? And you know, maybe I'm way richer than you are. So it's like, oh, you know, actually, like, it could really set me up if you pay me off for my brother. So you're like, 30 sheep or something. I'm like, okay, it's a little steep. 22 sheep, and I'll throw in a really good shield or something, right? So we can kind of argue about this. So the gods, pray, pray for doesn't want to kill Loki. I mean, pretty wild. So he says, well, you're going to have to pay me for him. And what you're going to have to do is skin my son. <laughs> make a bag out of his skin, fill that bag with gold, and then cover it on the outside to where I can't even see a whisker of it anymore. And I don't look, you're like, that's a lot of gold. Where can we get that much gold? And Loki says, well, I know where I can get that much gold. I know a dwarf who's a fish. That's the one I killed, though. Right, that's a different one. That's a different fish. Uh, who has a lot of gold? So Loki takes a net, fishes up this other dwarf is a fish named Anvari, and um, the fish is struggling the net, and he says, hey, man, let me go. And he says, only if you hand over all your gold. And he says, take it all. So Loki takes all this gold, but Loki says, hey, 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 I see you're hiding something in a fin there. There's, there's one more ring or something, and he pulls out this golden ring that Anvari fish is trying to hide from him. And Anvari says, for taking my last ring, I put a curse on that ring, it will cause the death of anyone who owns it. Cursed rings. This gets real Tolkien in real fast. <laughs> um, so Loki says, well, no skin off my back because I'm not going to own it. Right. So Loki takes the whole treasure to Hraithmar's place, and Odin and Loki count it up. They fill up uh, the otter skin and cover the otter skin over. But Odin is attracted to one ring. I'll make this up. Mm -hmm. It is perhaps precious to him. <laughs> <laughs> and Odin hides it. And so Hraithmar looks over the gold filled otter skin and gold covered on skin, but he sees one whisker poking up out of the gold. He says, Oh, you better cover that up. And so Odin also reluctantly puts that one last ring on. And so the curse passes to Hraithmar. So, sure enough, uh, Faulkner, the oldest brother, comes to Hraithmar and says, Hey, precious. <laughs> This is my birthday, precious, or something. Um, you know, hey, I should have some of that treasure because he was my brother. Hraithmar says, no, you can't have any of the treasure. So Falcon kills his dad and turns into a dragon. 
I do not know how he turns into a dragon. That mechanism is never discussed. There, that crappy looking ass is a dragon. Um, and there's a there's a dragon. He's a beard. Um, so he sits on the on this treasure board and guards it. And uh, so Reagan comes out of his flashback and says, so sacred, that's how I know it is a dragon. And so he says, well, I'm willing to kill this dragon, your brother, um, but first I've got to go avenge my dad. He's got his priorities on the street. So he goes and avenges his dad, and one of the most remarkable things about the saga of the Wilson as a part of Norse literature is that him avenging his dad is such an afterthought. It's this really brief scene. Like he goes, he fights this guy, he kills him. You know, I think mean, he kills him with a blood eagle. I mean, he does that horrible thing. You know what that is? Yes. From TV, Thanks right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, the Vikings TV show made this really famous, right? Pull out the there's one that's like that. But like, it, it, but it doesn't make a big deal out of it, which is kind of strange. So Sigurd comes back. Yeah, it's a big deal to the guy gets blood eagle, but what's a blood eagle to a friend? Um, <laughs> so. Sigurd comes back, having avenged his dad, and Regan says, hey, so you avenged your dad, you're ready to kill this dragon. Sigurd says, not quite. If I'm gonna kill a dragon, I'm gonna have like a dragon killing sword. You know, like not just a regular sword. Like, you need to go to Spyderco in Golden, Colorado and get me <laughs> a high quality American forge sword, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, they don't pay me. <laughs> <laughs> Paid me in knives as well. Um, so Regan says, Well, I'm a dwarf. Of course, I got to forge my sword. So Regan forges a sword, and Sigurd comes to Regan and Smithy, and he picks up the sword, and he swings it at the anvil, and the sword shatters. It's like, This is not a dragon slaying sword, Regan. He says, Fine, all right, I'll make you another one. So Regan makes him another sword, and uh, Sigurd comes back and says, How about this one? And Regan says, if this sword isn't ready for your dragon slaying needs, I don't want to make a sword. That's all this, by the way, from the Earl of Norse. And uh, Sigurd says, well, let's see. And he swings it at the anvil and it shatters. It's like, all right, Regan, you cannot make me my dragon slaying sword. So Sigurd goes to his mom and he says, mom, is it true that you have the shards of the sword that was broken? Oh. More of those, those uh, shades of Tolkien, right? And she says, yes, I have the fragments. So Sigmund takes the fragments of this sword, brings them to Reagan, and says, forge me a new sword out of this one. So Reagan puts it together, and uh, it shines brown and green, which is kind of weird. <laughs> Sorry, it's colors. It's, well, it's not that visually appealing, maybe, but you know, if, you, if you like the kind of zombie palette, is that your guess is in vogue? And uh, Sigurd picks the sword up and slices through the anvil and cuts it in half like butter. He's like, all right, all right, I'm going to drag his side sword now. And he takes it out to a gentle creek that flows by the smithy, and he throws in a tuft of wool, and then he sticks the sword in, and the wool is split just by the gentle force of the creek. He's like, all right, all right, all right, I've got this really smithy copy now. I've got this really strong, sharp sword. I can kill a dragon. He says, ah, oh, but if I'm going to kill a dragon, I need, like, a dragon killing horse. So he goes to his mom's new husband, King Alda of Denmark, and he says, hey, uh, will you give me a coming of age gift? And he says, anything. He says, I want, a, I want a horse. He says, well, go out to my Remuda and pick what horse you want. And so Sigurd so goes out to the Remuda, and he's looking over the horses, but he is no judge of horse flesh. He has no idea what to look for in a horse. So he's approached by an old man he's never seen before. <laughs> no, it's good. And he says, I'll have you pick a horse, drive them all into the river, and the one who doesn't swim to the other side, the one who stays in the river, that's the horse you want. I have no idea why that's how test for a horse. But that's how we test it. So he drives all the horses into the water, and the one who doesn't go out the other side is named Ronnie. There's my terrible horse drawing. <laughs> and the old man, whoever he is, tells him, uh, by the way, this horse is descended from Sleipnir, the horse of Odin. Pretty rad. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Sigurd's sword, once it's before, is known as Gram. You thought I was going to say Andrew, the flame of the nice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite little facts about Gram is 
This is a total sign up, but I think it's fun. Do you know that Islanders come up with their own names for everything? So if you read through an entire modern Icelandic dictionary, as I once did for work purposes, you will learn that there is an Icelandic word and separate Icelandic acronym for like DNA. Like it's really amazing. They are super committed to this in a way even the French are not. <laughs> But it's a little bit more democratic. There's, now there's a web forum actually where people submit what they want for things to be and people kind of vote on it. It's actually kind of fun. There's more buy-in I think than in France, which I think makes people kind of do a little bit more. But they have their own dinosaur names. So they use Edla, an old word for lizard, as like the equivalent of Saurus. And Tyrannosaurus is Kramedla. So he's Legendary sort of sort. It's like it's like we it's like, it's like we call yeah it's like we call them Excalibur swords. <laughs> I actually really like that. I think it's a really cool, really cool touch. Anyway, so he's got his he's got his dragon sign sword. He's got his dragon sign horse, and he says, "Dragon, point me in the direction of that dragon." So they go off to where Falkner lives, Falkner the dragon, and. Uh, Reagan points out to Sigurd, well, here is the big track that he wears in the dirt. Because Norse dragons move like snakes, they don't have legs, right? <laughs> if you want a really stupid side note about this, where you sit in the same Oh, yeah. <laughs> says, oh my god, look at this huge track that he wears where he slithers. Look at this 30-foot tall cliff where he leans down to get a drink of water from the creek at the bottom. This is an enormous strength. <laughs> right? He says, I don't know, I think he's in the normal size range for snakes. <laughs> Quote. Basically, the old Um and, and snake and dragon are the same word. It's orm. Our word worm. Notice that Old Norse always loses W or B before O or U. That's why it's worm, ormer, wor, or, odin, woden, wolf, wolver, etc. So, ormer. So, uh, Sigurd says, well, uh, I guess what I'm going to do is pursue the classic strategy of killing a dragon based on its very soft underside. So, he digs a pit in the path of the dragon. Uh, so, you know, the dragon will slither over and he'll stab it from below. And Reagan says, yeah, that's a good idea. You're a coward, you're a coward, you're a coward. You're not going to be, you're not brave enough to wait for the dragon. And then Reagan runs away. <laughs> digging a well. So while Sigurd's digging, he's approached by a stranger that no dragon's ever seen before. <laughs> it happens a lot. Odin is grooming him, right? You understand how this works, right? Like he wants Sigurd, but he wants it at the right time. So, he says, hey, it looks like you're dragging a, digging a uh, dragon killing pit there. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> but you know, dragon blood is poisonous, so you want to dig multiple little satellite pits around the pit that you're in so that the dragon blood goes into those pits and not into the pit that you're in. That way you don't get hit by the poison. I have no idea why this is supposed to work because you would presume the blood would also come to the pit that he's in, but maybe dragon blood works like one of the sprinkler things. <laughs> so Sigurd digs some auxiliary pits and then he waits. And finally, Faulkner slithers over and Sigurd stabs him in the heart as he slithers over and Faulkner dies. Sort of. He's a big enough character that gets last words. Lots of last words. <laughs> There's an entire poem in the poetic uh, of his last words. Because as the dragon dies, he is really, really curious about Sigurd. So he says, who are you? Right? Who, who is this man who's finally had the courage to, to kill me? And Sigurd knows that an enemy who knows his true name, right, his name and his father's name, can put a curse on him with his dying breath. So 
He says, I have no name, and I have no father. And the dragon is like legit confused. Like, well, if you have no name, what do people call you? If you have no father, where did you come from? So he says, I will never tell you my name. I will never tell you my father's name. I am Sigurd, son of Sigurd. <laughs> <laughs> it happens exactly like this. Oh, and so people look at this today and are like, what the hell is this? And I think that it's very much in line with the dream logic of men, right? They have no way of talking. They never talk about internal states. They never say, like, he thought, right? They, they only discuss internal states by speaking. So I think we have to understand this is sort of a dream situation. Like, he's thinking, gosh, if I tell him my name and my father's name, it's, it's bad, but he's sort of enchanted into it or something. Or it's sort of like in a dream where it's like, oh my gosh, I know that I'm at this ledge, and if I jump, I'll have to work this for 19 months. <laughs> but you jump anyway, right? Because it's a dream, you can't help yourself, right? You make terrible decisions. So he says, actually, Faulkner never curses him. Faulkner just starts telling him, and I'm not kidding, tons of trivia. Sir. <laughs> The name of the island where the gods and their enemies will find a Ragnarok is called. Sigurd, you should never sail too close to shore. Sigurd, just stuff like this. <laughs> what, is, what is up with this? Probably part of it is the notion that when you die, you're on the edge of the world. And so you're kind of on the edge of all the other worlds. You potentially are seeing more of the future than someone would who isn't dying. So like he has a little bit of access to stuff that Sigurd otherwise uh, wouldn't have access to. Anyway. His last words are actually not a curse, but a warning. He says, my brother Regan betrayed me, he's going to betray you too. So actually, Faulkner, Faulkner's a gentleman, as far as I'm concerned, because Regan is totally going to betray Sigurd. Regan crawls out of where he's been hiding, and he says, hey, hey, Regan. He says, uh, Sigurd, wow, you killed my brother. <laughs> <laughs> but you accomplished a great deed. Hey, would you do me a little, little favor, brother killer? Uh, <laughs> would you cut his heart out and cook it for me? It's like, it's a sure <laughs> Who am I to judge what brothers do? By the way, to cut his heart out, he has to get his blood on him, right? So, I don't know. I guess dragon blood isn't poisonous after it's dead. So, he starts cooking the heart. He, he makes a, like a rotisserie for it. It's actually medieval runestones, Viking Age runestones, from hundreds of years before this saga was written down that depict this scene, by the way, him cooking the heart. And he reaches out with his thumb to test it. It's cooked enough. And I say thumb because it's actually what's in the rhinestones. It's just his finger in the sun. And it burns his thumb. And so what do you do if his thumb is burning? So he tastes dragon blood. So you might think, ah, he's going to die. No. Taste cooked dragon blood. That gives you the magical property of? Knowledge. Talking to birds. Talking to birds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All of a sudden, he understands the language of birds. So there are a bunch of birds talking around him, uh, and uh, what? Do you have this? I, I, I wrote parts of it. Do you have it? <laughs> oh, okay. I was gonna say you should. That that should be for, for knowing that. You should, you should go with this. <laughs> um. All right. Well, but it's very nice to find. <laughs> won't, won't say no. Um. <coughs> so he hears some birds talking around. Him. Now, in the Old Norse text is called Igda. Most translators have taken this as um, nuthatch. This is not a word used for nuthatch in any Scandinavian language I'm aware of, but it is a word used for the wagtail. If you've ever seen wagtails, these kind of robin sized birds in Europe and Africa, white and black, the tails bob up and down. So here's these wagtails talking, and they're talking about him. <laughs> Just like when you're in a bus and you hear a language you don't understand, it's like they're talking about me. But the birds actually are talking about him. They're like, wow, Sigurd's great. Yeah, oh man, Sigurd killed the dragon. Cool. Regan is totally going to betray him. Oh, you're right, sister. Yeah, he totally is. Yeah, hey, sister. They're all, they're all waiting. Hey, sister. If I were Sigurd, you know what I would do? I would let Regan leave here about a head shorter. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of love that phrase. So Sigurd is advised by tons of people in the saga. The only advice he takes is from Odin about doing the pits. And of course, he takes the advice, everything the birds tell him to do. <laughs> he does. So the birds tell him to kill Reagan, so he kills Reagan, cuts his head off, and then he drinks, he 
eats Hawkins' heart, drinks Hawkins' blood, drinks Reagan's blood, which I don't know what that does for him. <laughs> but then he packs up the gold on Karani's back, the horse's back, and prepares to ride away. Before he does, the birds say, hey, Sigurd, you're awesome. You know one thing you don't have is a wife. Sigurd <laughs> so says, well, who do you have in mind for me? I'm in the market. He says, there's two ladies you got to check out. <laughs> Birds. They're not birds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm. That'd probably be funny. Oh, that is what I don't think it's funny. They say, behind door number one, you've got to go meet the lady, Brynhildr, who was a Valkyrie. She killed the wrong man. Odin told her to kill one man, and she killed another. So now she's in prison inside a burning ring of fire on top of a hill and you could ride up there and ride through the ring of fire and you could have her. That's behind door number one. <laughs> behind door number two, Princess Gudrun. Her dad, King Yuki, is king of the Burgundians if you want to be all German about it, the Kyukuns if you want to be Norse about it, and uh, she would also make an awesome match for you. So, Sigurd, right off and me, your lady. Will you choose the lady behind door number one or door number two? Next time on Bolsons, <laughs> we will return and see who Siri chooses and how either way he chose, it would have been the wrong choice. <laughs> That's a pretty good pause point for this. So I will be back in April and I'll do more of this. And I also post these as videos on my YouTube channel if you miss part two and you want to come back and watch it. I just take any questions, remarks, criticisms, complaints, manifestos? <laughs> uh, in, the, in the culture, was there an emphasis on the oldest child like we have in Western culture? Uh, the, the eight sons, they were the two of the eight. Were they the oldest two? Yeah, Sigmund and Sigmund are the oldest. So there's kind of a value attached to being the oldest. It's not as big of a deal in a sense because typically the sons will inherit equally from the father. They'll kind of like divvy up the land. This ends up being the biggest problem for kings because hypothetically all the sons inherit the kingdom and so what winds up happening is they end up killing each other. Uh, this is famous in what happens to the sons of King Harold Fairhair because he has like 90 sons. <laughs> and the one who wins is named Eric Bloodaxe and it is his brother's blood that gets on his act. Um, so, yeah, there's often kind of a status to being the oldest, which I think is n a near universal, but I don't think it's as big of a deal. And sometimes in the sagas, it'll even be younger sons who are sort of the bigger hero, um, or protagonist, at least. Like uh, Hegel Skallagers comes to mind, hero of Hegel Saga is a younger son, and he's, he's much more the protagonist than his older brother. Questions from our schools, complaints, manifestos. Manifesto, that's your tradition since my uh, teaching at UC Berkeley days. I would get manifestos. Yes. I have a question about runestones. You were like um, traveling over to study um, new discoveries. And um, one of them you had mentioned, and I have not found it again, is runestone memorials that were with, carved by mothers and of those who came, did not come back. Sure. And where you found those, I'm just curious about, and if you can. Well, so the, the, I'm trying to think of what you could easily search where you could find uh, some of these. There is a group of stones that are sometimes referred to as the, uh, Ingvar runestones from a group of men who went east with Ingvar the wide traveled in Sweden. And uh, there are some stones from that group that are by the wives for the, uh, the men who died while they were out. Uh, there may be a way on Runedata, the Swedish website that has a huge database of runestones. There may actually be a way, I, th I think there is, 
to s organize your search by um, like speaker, this, like the, the speaker is a woman, like it's in a woman's voice, or like refers to a woman or something like that. I think you can actually do that. Um, let, let, let's talk after, I might be able to connect you with some specific ones like but I can't think of a specific like call number for one off the top of my head. There is actually though there is one um, the one that has this that has Sigurd with his thumb on Falkir's heart. The inscription in runes has nothing to do with Sigurd, and it's I think it's a woman's memorial to her mom. I think she says she built a bridge nearby for her mother. I think that's right. I have to look at it again. But I think I think that is actually a, a woman's voice. What do you say? So, um, one of the things I was, I was wondering is I, I noted that like um, they they mentioned the Burgundians in the Volsunga saga, and uh, I, I know that the Burgundians, the Lombards, and the Goths and a lot, of, a lot of the tribes that invaded the Roman Empire uh, may, may have started out. I've heard that they started out closer to like the Baltic region. So there's sort of like strands of like a, a joint Germanic heritage between uh, these different tribes and, and the Norse. And is that is it, because I know they probably would have had this, a similar religion, so is this sort of like a common heritage between them yeah. that we're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So up to probably around the 200s AD maybe, the Germanic speaking peoples are all living close to the North Sea or the Baltic Sea. So that includes the Goths, the Burgundians, the Vandals, uh, who are later going to go way south of there, even into Africa in the case of the Vandals. So even after they start to move, they bring with them a similar language, similar religion, similar names, uh, and a common world of stories. And in fact, several characters in the saga of the Volsung and other legendary sagas, like the two sagas of mythical heroes, but that's back there, the saga of Hadrian and the saga of Frol, refer to people as Goths and Hans. There's some sort of memory of these related peoples in their early activities. Um, you know, Gothic is recognizably a closely related language to Old Norse, just like Old English is, just like Old German is. And, and when they do mention their gods, which only the Norse have preserved a lot of stories about, but they get mentioned in English and German and Gothic. Um, you can tell it's the same roster, right, just with the appropriate language change, right? So you've got Old Norse Odin with the W or the V lost, you've got Old English Woden, and the German Votan. So in the same way, you've got like the Volsung series. Actually, the earliest mention of any of the Volsung series is in Old English. Uh, Beowulf is actually the earliest place where any of them are named. There's a brief little story. You ever heard of Beowulf? There's a ton of digressions in it. It's like listening to me. <laughs> Every now and then, somebody will just pause to tell some totally different story. And there is a point where someone pauses, I think Hrothgar pauses, and he talks about um, Sigmund and Sinfjotli, the old English forms of their names, Siemund and Fithala, who kill a dragon. So it's like either the old English version of the story mixes Sigmund and Sigurd, or the Norse version splits Sigmund into two. It's hard to say which direction that goes in. But that's the earliest mention. And then there's the independent sort of attestation of the whole Volsung story in Germany, the Nibelungen lead, and related traditions. Anybody ever heard of the Nibelungen lead? Okay. So it's like the saga of the Volsungs, but it's told by ZZ Top. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's sharp dressed man, like it's pages and pages and pages about all the cool clothes everybody's wearing. Like, am I wrong? I've heard of it, but I haven't, I haven't had a chance to read it. Okay. Yeah. I'm not wrong. <laughs> so I, got, I, read, I read about that as well, oh, okay. because it was sort of a, another version, from yeah. my understanding. Yeah, the Nibelung Lead is actually written down about the same time as the Saga of Wilson was written down. Um, you know, they, the, the, the Norse and the Germans are clearly working from a story that's descended from the same story. They haven't learned it from each other. 
Right. Names are different. Roles get reversed. You know, this guy's a good guy in the story, but a bad guy in that story. Um, and the German story is way more uh, chivalrized. They kind of turned into, you know, knights in shining armor and jousting and stuff like that. But um, they're recognizable based on originally the same story. So yeah, they, they, there was certainly some cluster of stories already in the time when Germanic speaking people split uh, related to some proto pulses, I think. Is that kind of roughly what you're Yeah, that's saying? what I was wondering, because like, no, I was thinking about the geography of it, yeah. where they would have started from. Yeah, well, they're all coming ultimately from somewhere around the Baltic of Mars. Okay, thanks. Other questions, remarks, criticism, complaints, manifestos? Oh, sorry for my. I guess I have a question. Um, yeah, the uh, the plot lines are always so convoluted and nonsensical, and I was wondering if uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> if, if that's something like uh, Kennings that have lost their loss in translation, or is it you might have mentioned, or you might have answered that when you're talking about Sigurd, and that's trying to give the uh, dream state? Yeah, there's a lot of dream logic, I think, to, to myth. And, and, and stories like this are myth. But you get these complicated plots, even in the stories that aren't at all mythical, right? The stories that are much more kind of everyday, for example, sagas of Icelanders. Um, I think part of it is different expectations of the audience. So these are composed as poetry or written down as sagas for people who exist in the same culture and already know the outlines of the story. So they're skipping over things that probably we would like to hear about, some, con some connecting tissue. Um, you know, you look at something like the poems in the Poetic Edda, which contain a lot of stories of the Volsungs too, and they're, they skip so fast from one scene to another. And probably they're not the first time somebody's hearing the story. Someone's heard the story before from dad or uncle or grandma or whatever, and they already know the gist of it. So what they're listening for is like, oh man, this is a good like highlight reel of the story, right? So if I sit here and I tell you about a good football game that I watched, I'm not gonna tell you play by play by play, right? I'm gonna be like, did you see this really good play and this really good play, right? But and like, oh man, so and so did a great job. Right, but I'm not going to be like, all right, so it started off. <laughs> it's like, Raiders went to the receipt. You know, like, it's, you're not going to go into all that, that detail. So I think part of it is that. Part of it is also that they are, um, they're used to keeping huge family trees in their heads, right, in a way that we're not. I don't know what second cousin means. Is that the same as first cousin we moved? Okay, I have no clue. Um, I can name my first cousins, uh, Destiny Kids. <laughs> right, I mean, that's how, that's how a lot of us live now. Like, we're not as tied into these super extended families. Um, they are, right? Family is the central moral universe for them, right? It is actually the moral unit, right? When you kill someone, you have offended a family, and you can make restitution to that family. It's not about the individual. So they carry in their heads these massive family maps. And you know, I sit here and I'm like, okay, so this person was married to this person, but they have this kid. This is all just easy to know. But it's something that's way harder for us to keep track of. And I think that also affects us reading these stories. And Volsung's is not that bad. <laughs> Volsung's is pretty straightforward as far as things can go that way. Nyal saga? It's like that big, okay? It is 800 named characters, right? And you get to like chapter 100, okay. Have you seen the Monty Python skit on the Droll Saga? <laughs> okay, it's pretty good. Um, so it starts off with this guy riding in this misty, ascetic landscape, and he rides up to the camera and says, this is the Droll Saga. And he says, so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the cousin of so-and-so, who killed so-and-so, who was the father of so-and-so, who had to wife so-and-so, who was the daughter of so-and-so. 
there's like 90 people. <laughs> like it's 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 such perfect vintage Monty Python because the joke is how long it goes. <laughs> it's an actual chapter of the song. <laughs> <laughs> the joke is real. <laughs> It's genealogical gold. Yeah. It's also like chapter 237. <laughs> so it's not even the beginning. It's just like, all right, here's a guy, and it's literally like introducing a guy who's going to rob somebody else on the road and go. <laughs> so it gets worse. Right? But it's just because, and, and probably part of it too is the stories that are designed for an Icelandic audience. Iceland is a fairly small country. They're talking about people who are maybe up to like eight generations back, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's my, my great-great-uncle, right? They've, got, they've kind of got that going on, like, oh, cool, 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 yeah, you, you name drop my cousin. Kind of thing. I think that, that's part of it, too. So I, I think several things like that are going on. I actually um, have talked about translating Al's song with my publisher, and uh, we've agreed that basically to do that, you have to put these genealogies as footnotes. Because I'm teaching this at universities, one thing that happens to keep 100% this track of who to keep track of. Right? It's like, okay, I just got 90 names, which one do I follow? <laughs> right? So I would do like these maps, right? Where I would turn them into hummingbirds and things to try to make them more memorable. Anyway. You're, you're lucky you weren't my student program. <laughs> the question is, Sebastian's complaints complaints manifestos I can deal with. Do, do not criticize me by the way, for how convoluted the stories are. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> but the great course is me for me. <laughs> the gods can't all die. That's so depressing. Some of them have to live. We've got to change this. I didn't write this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I can change that? And somebody's not going to be like, no. <laughs> it's like, they're going to call me on it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but like, you know, the big ones do. Come on. Like, it's pretty depressing. I guess Balder can Balder. 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 Hooray. <laughs> and Halder. And Bobby and Mother. Uh, and Honey, I guess. That's about it. Maybe Norther, because he's supposed to go back to the Bonnier after Ragnarok, according to Bob from this one. Questions of Rashi's complaints, manifestos. Like, Join me, I'll hang out for a while, I might go back there. Sometimes I turn that into my godfather corner. <laughs> <laughs> Eric will be my conciliary. <laughs> Come to me. I'm the day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> to sing here, King of Yutala. Alright. Jared Shalda, thank you so much. All the best. <laughs> Oh, I forgot to do the book giveaway. Hold on. Who doesn't have who doesn't have the whole six? Okay, if you don't have the song of the whole sings, you can get us a copy of the whole sings right here, right now, by answering whole sings trivia. We haven't read it. How are we supposed to know? Well, it'll be stuff that I mentioned. Okay. All right. All right, what's a deep cut, but not too much of a deep cut? <laughs> um, do you remember, uh, hey Susan, would you pick, because I would close my eyes. Sure. Do you remember, uh, raise your hand, don't shout it out. Do you remember the name of uh, Sigur Sword? Back there, girl. The guy in the beard, I think he's in with Okay. She's a drum. <laughs> okay. Drum? Drum. For you, sir. All right. Yeah. Uh, We're talking together. <laughs> so, he said. So split it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're together, so. Okay. <laughs> Limited right. mass. Uh, That's the only question you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 Okay. Um, slightly harder one, maybe. Um, the name or the translation of the name of the tree that Odin sticks a sword into. Is that like a family tree? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. Nice. Congrats. Yeah.